room. And a lot of odds going for how soon this thing's going to be over. Mostly staff. Doug's got 405. Anybody want to go for 410? Take the over. The over and unders. I'll take the over. All right. Good evening. This is the March the 1st, 2017 board workshop. We'll welcome you here. And at this point, we'll call the meeting to order. Okay, if you would please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Ms. Garcia, roll call please. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker, Bill Holan, Elise Jones, Deb Gardner, David Beacom, Greg Stokes, Randy Wheelock, Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, Robin Kneech, Roger Partridge, Dave Weaver, Gail Watson, Libby Zabo, Casey Ty, Bob Pfeiffer, John Marriott, Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. and Justin. Lynn Baca, George Teal, Jason Bauer, Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Sharp, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glor, Sarah Karis Graves, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sudanik, Bruce Beckman, Jackie Malay, Wynn Shaw, Here. Joan Peck, Gabe Sinclair, <coughs> Ashley Stolzen, Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Here. <clears throat> Heidi Williams, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, and Bill Van Meter. Okay. Well, congratulations and I appreciate you very much putting Dr. Cog at the top of your priority list and not going to Washington, D.C. this week. Yeah. So this should uh, be a lengthy meeting. On the next item on the agenda is the summary of the February 1st board work session. Uh, the minutes are there and they've been published on the website. If there are no changes to it, uh, we will move to accept the minutes as published if there is none. Mr. Murkowski. So moved. so moved to have a second. Mr. Roth is second. All those in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the <laughs> chair will recognize that the minutes are accepted. Next item on the agenda is the uh, public comment. The chair requests there is no public comment on issues for which a prior public meeting has been held before the board. Public comment is open and each member of the public is entitled to up to three minutes. If there is anyone in the audience who'd like to make public comment this time, we ask you to please come to the podium. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Discussion on the process to evaluate coordinated growth management initiatives. Mr. Calvert. You would please. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will say, if I am presenting, always take the over, so I would not get <laughs> too excited. But I'm also I'm just a little, you know, I'm an insider when it when it comes to that. So uh, thank you for taking the time this afternoon to have what I um, consider a very uh, initial conversation, um, as the agenda item uh, suggests, on sort of designing and evaluating. Uh, sort of the collective growth management initiative, uh, currently known as the urban growth boundary, to be known in the future as whatever it's known as. Um, I will say that I would characterize, if you're playing a drinking game today, uh, the words that I will probably say the most often are high level. So take a drink uh, when I say that. Uh, I will also, just a word of warning, probably interchangeably use the terms uh, initiative and program, though in some ways I think of them as the same thing. So if I 
just in terms of terminology, I don't want anybody to be um, th thrown off um, by that. So uh, the memo lays out um, some kind of maybe some process background um, information. So I won't hit that um, too heavily in the in the presentation, just to kind of catch everyone up. Uh, obviously, we've initiated a conversation as as the board. Um, on urban growth boundary, kind of towards the tail end of the MetroVision conversation, largely so that we could get a head start on that conversation rather than simply waiting um, for the plan to be adopted and then starting. So there were a few items at the workshop um, back in, I think, October and November um, that we came to the work session to discuss. Um, the, one of the things that ultimately also maybe address, uh, sort of uh, was part of the overall landscape um, that maybe we had not uh, predicted at the end of the year was the amount of um, comments we received on the MetroVision draft that were really centered and focused um, on the urban growth boundary um, program that exists today. Um, and the other thing that's mentioned um, in the in your packet is that we um, have been having um, quite a few technical conversations on ultimately to try to give you data that you requested. Um, this group requested uh, that what you would really like to see is um, what land is currently classified as urban in our region and maybe how that has changed over time to really help inform this, this conversation. We feel like that's a very big piece of the conversation, but we're just not quite there um, for a variety of reasons. Um, number one, we wanted to do some consultation with your staff um, because this is both kind of a shared local and regional um, process. Um, and so we held meetings, I believe, in December and January. Um, on that, we've kind of have concluded that. Uh, but we are sort of currently working through kind of the technical approach to get to uh, a more a, be, a, a better and improved process to, to give you um, that data. We have a, a really sophisticated model, but un unfortunately, when you say sophisticated, you should also say the word temperamental. Um, so we we are trying to improve the data the, the data that can be added and, and influenced um, th that influence the, the results. But every time you add something, you've got to check to see. Are we questioning whether the, the results that you, maybe the, the last iteration looked pretty good, do they still um, look good? So um, there is still um, a fair amount of time and effort involved in getting, bringing that data to you. We are very hopeful that we can bring that to uh, this group at your next uh, meeting um, in April. Uh, so really, as I um, hopefully said earlier, uh, I would view this conversation as an entry into um, designing uh, an initiative. And I'll just sort of bring up this. Uh, a strategic planning model that you've seen a billion times, um, if not a billion plus one. Obviously, the board worked throughout the MetroVision process to create a plan that really responds um, to our overall strategic planning model. Uh, we really now are focusing on a very strategic, very specific strategic initiative uh, around the topic of kind of our efforts to collectively uh, manage growth in our region. But it's important for you, the ultimate body that will evaluate whether that initiative is working right, is successful, um, is the right level of um, effort for, for impact. It's your job to evaluate um, that initiative. And so we want to hear a little bit from you today as to how you might um, evaluate that initiative. And that could be Obviously, the starting point is the current urban growth um, boundary program, but also any additional or new programs um, that you might ultimately decide uh, might work better. Um, so just a little bit, uh, I am not going to hit, I'm not going to give you like an urban growth boundary 101. Uh, we've offered that presentation numerous times over the last few years, um, spent quite a bit of time um, on that subject um, at, the, at the board workshop, so really, what I'm going to try to do in the first part of the presentation is to set a little bit of context for you about how that initiative that exists today, how it came to be, and what it was trying to address, and how it is measured in terms of what it is supposed to do. And then really I will turn the conversation over at the tail end to the discussion is, what is today's context and your viewpoint so that when we are thinking through, you are thinking through ultimately initiatives that help us uh, accomplish the, the MetroVision outcome to, um, again, collectively manage growth in our region. We as staff has a, have a sense as to how you would ultimately evaluate both current and potentially uh, future initiatives. So some of you have probably seen this before. We use this slide um, quite a bit. So take yourself back to the mid-1990s. Uh, in the Denver region and this article that came out in National Geographic with this great caption to this photograph, uh, to this image, like blots in a geographic Rorschach test, front range cities ooze toward one another, right? Denver and many other metro areas around the country were all sort of battling out whether you wanted to or not uh, to be called the poster child of sprawl. I mean, that was the narrative um, that was happening in many metro areas around um, the country that were experiencing uh, significant growth um, on, on their edges. 
Um, the reality is that by the time this article came out in November of 1996, the board at the time and stakeholders from around the region were already engaged in a very real conversation about growth in our region and really how to ultimately make sure um, that we can make the most out of the growth opportunities that, that faced us um, at the time. And so to give you kind of an idea of what that, that looked and felt like, one of the sparks um, to the board level and regional conversation about that was some analysis that, that was really taking shape um, at Dr. Cog around the same time that really sort of took all of the, the overall um, uh, all the local pl uh, comprehensive plans and growth plans in the region and stitched them together to sort of ask what is, if you collected all the local aspirations for growth, what is our growth footprint um, going forward? And, and during that, that exercise, we realized there were, the plans were, con were oftentimes contradic contradictory. They, they overlapped. Um, frankly, the region was not even necessarily aware of, of how local um, communities were anticipating growing um, into the future. If you stitched all those plans together, those collections of, of local growth aspirations, we were talking about a region with, with a, an urban footprint of over 1,000 square miles. At the time, the board simply asked the question, is that tenable? Is that something that we want as a region? Is that really what we want our future um, to be? So that really kind of sparked the conversation that, that in many ways resulted in the adoption of the very first Metro Vision plan back in 1997. And in that plan, the Urban Growth Boundary Program, in general as we know it today, it has been refined many times over the past um, two decades. But that's really, again, sort of the origin story of our current um, collective growth management uh, initiative. So when you talk about um, MetroVision uh, uh, 2020 uh, adopted back in 1997, and really, frankly, all MetroVision plans um, since, uh, we oftentimes describe it as, if we were to connote or describe a very simplified regional growth strategy, we think of it as two-pronged, and they're shown in the graphic as, as separate, but really they're complementary. Um, the first is this notion that as a region we want to manage our urban footprint. We want to understand how we're going to grow. Um, we, want to, we, want to, we want to manage it. Uh, we want to understand um, sort of what the resource uh, uh, requirements are going to be uh, to support um, the conversion of non-urban um, land uses to urban land, land uses, that full um, picture of issues. Paired with that is this idea of kind of an urban intensification strategy, that there are places in the region that are already developed or anticipated developing oh, over the next 15 or 20 years that are looking to become more dense, that are going to become mixed-use places, that, that want to be multimodal in nature, that want to have a variety of housing options, they are willing to accept um, additional population and, and, and employment growth. In our lexicon, we typically describe those places um, as urban centers. So one of the ways that the board ended up um, sort of embracing uh, the, the concept of a, of a sort of a collective growth management strategy um, through the urban growth boundary is through a series of scenario um, exercises, asking ourselves as a region, what happens if we grow in a different way, more compact, less compact, different types of um, tr transportation, um, infrastructure investments, those sort of conversations, and using tools um, that we have here at Dr. Cog, analyzing the results, and, and again, trying to choose what feel, felt like the, the future that made the most sense um, for the region. I'm, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this, for instance, is about a decade old um, that was done as part of the, Metro, the, the initial MetroVision 2035 uh, planning process, and it reaffirmed um, previous scenario conversations that the board had that, um, and this conversation was really rooted in this idea of do we need to expand um, the urban growth boundary, and the, the finding was that if you, if you focused um, development and compact growth uh, throughout the region, you actually saw a lot of results that ultimately were to, to the benefit of the region, whether that's less spending on uh, transportation infrastructure, whether it's higher, uh, more transit use, less congestion, uh, cleaner air. The closer you get to the edge of the circle, the better you're doing. So that, that more compact form was paying off in terms of sort of key metrics and indicators that at the time uh, the board was interested in understanding how those various scenarios would impact uh, those indicators and metrics. Uh, fast forward to so 2013, a part of the process for the most current MetroVision plan that obviously you spent a lot of time on. Uh, staff, again, supported some scenario analysis work, uh, this time focusing on that urban intensification side of things, um, trying to understand if the region does achieve um, a significant amount of growth in, in urban centers as designated in the MetroVision plan, 
what are the regional impacts? Can we, can, we, can we justify continuing to emphasize that strategy going forward? And those scenario results also spoke to, to the value to the region of, of, of that type of, of growth model, whether it's um, congestion going down by focusing in urban centers to um, uh, the percentage of population in the region that had good access uh, to job centers via transit. Many of the indicators and metrics that the board has historically thought were important to understand overall regional performance moved in the right direction um, it, through an urban center um, uh, uh, development strategy. So back to kind of the high level uh, notion of what um, really the UGB program was anticipated uh, to, to accomplish and what its purpose was going back 20 years, but this is obviously still the initiative that, that we have um, in the region today. Um, again, the board wanted to maintain and improve quality of life. There was an understanding and an acceptance that um, uh, significant uh, growth at the, at the edges of the region uh, were potentially going to cause any number of impacts um, to quality of life, oftentimes uh, through sort of the, the cost of um, supporting uh, the, the expansion of infra infrastructure being one of the key things that the region was concerned about. Um, early on, there was just this recognition that as a region, we didn't quite know what, how, how locals were viewing um, their individual growth aspirations because they obviously are a very big driver. You are a very big driver um, of how this region grows going forward, and it's important to have um, that dialogue. And then one thing that I didn't really hit, but I'll mention, um, sort of again, taking yourself back to the, to the mid-90s when this program or initiative was designed, um, late 80s, mid 90s, not in just in our state and in, in the Denver region, but around the country, uh, there was a proliferation of growth management legislation at the state level. Um, I've worked in a variety of states that had some version of growth management le legislation. And in Colorado, Colorado, there was some fear that what, you know, how the state might view growth management would not necessarily be the same as how locals and, region, and the regions might consider uh, growth management and to sort of maintain that local control was really important. And, you know, I know a lot of times people don't see the local control piece of the current urban growth boundary program, but it is very much rooted in this notion of, of really emphasizing local control and um, coordination and dialogue at the, at the regional level as well. The other piece of context I just wanted to provide before kind of getting into your discussion um, was that much like I want to hear, I wanted to describe sort of time stamping uh, the, the, the sort of state of, of, of growth and development in our region that shaped the current initiative. I want to hear from you in a little bit about sort of things that you see going on right now that maybe should be considered in thinking through evaluating both our existing program and any additional or, or new programs. I think Dr. Cog and our partners' um, data and tools are also a very important part um, of the conversation. I mean, this is, at its root, is oftentimes about data and coordination, and so our tools are oftentimes at the center of this conversation, so I thought it important for you to, to understand that. And again, drink at a very high level. I'm not going to talk to you about our very sophisticated land use and transportation models, but I want to kind of give you a sense of things. So. Going back, um, let's call it 10, 15 years ago, um, our older um, land use model, which is used to kind of understand um, how the region is going to grow um, going forward. Um, in both cases, they absolutely positively require local input and consul consultation. You just can't run a model and just assume and call it good. We need to coordinate um, with, um, with our member governments to understand um, their local growth aspirations. Sort of this version, the old land use model, actually I think it's more fair to just call it a spreadsheet, spreadsheet tool. Today is a series of, of econometric, very sophisticated models. This is not apples to apples. I don't know if it's apples to oranges or apples to like an artificial intelligence apple. They are not even in the same universe um, in terms of sophistication. But some of the limitations are, are not altogether um, dissimilar. Um, the old land use model over here, really was, I would call it, more policy-driven. Um, if, the, if the region had, and, and this did happen, the region sort of spoke to the importance of focusing development in urban centers, the model sort of considered that and created, um, assumed that those places were more attractive to development than other places. So in many ways, it was policy-driven. The desired future that we wanted to have, the models, part of the model's job was to build to that, to that future. But one of the constraints of the old land use model was that it really didn't consider the market, it didn't consider a regulatory environment, it didn't consider a lot of things that really were maybe the levers that would ensure that something would happen or would potentially prevent um, growth and development from happening. And in general, 
um, I think it's fair to say that that model did a, a better job of, of predicting um, growth on the edges of the region in part because we were particularly asking um, our local um, governments to, to identify growth targets uh, throughout the region. Fast forwarding to, 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 to today, um, again, series of um, uh, econometric models uh, really it's driven by uh, the real estate market and your local regulatory environment. Um, what this model is doing is it's trying to understand in macroeconomic terms growth in the region um, and demand for space. We need to build X number of single family homes um, based on the growth that's projected in the, in the region. Where can you legally build it um, and where's the market to build it? That, that's ultimately in very basic terms um, what it's looking to do. Um, so we really need um, local input where zone, today's zoning is actually expected to change over time because that, that's, that's one of the key, I describe it as the brakes. The brakes on the model is the current regulatory environment. If it says it's illegal to build something there, it's not going to build it. So if you have an area that's expected to grow but it's all zoned ag, um, we need to hear from our local partners that, well, in reality, we actually anticipate over time that to tr transition to, to residential uses. Um, and in general, I would, I would say that our current um, technical tools are actually more, are better at sort of infill and overlook sites and less, um, less um, not, not as good at sort of your greenfield sites, um, in, in part because it's thinking like a developer. It wants to see that development can be profitable in a location that potentially nothing has ever been built. So much like a developer has to oftentimes be the first one in, the model sort of acts the same way. It's just it's hesitant to put something on a greenfield site that has no sort of demonstration of like um, projects around it. So just a few more slides um, before we really get into to your conversation. And I, I in some ways viewed this as a surrogate to really what I hope to deliver to you um, next month, which is um, sort of a summary of how urban um, development has changed in the region over time and kind of maybe where we are today uh, in terms of urban development. And I will spend as much time on this um, as you want. I will also very much want to hit this as a course analysis just to kind of give you something uh, to react to and maybe inform your conversation a little bit. So we want to deliver next month kind of the state of the region in terms of urban development today. This is a glimpse of really kind of what our forecast talks about in terms of growth in the region going forward. So this is a more forward-looking um, analysis. And so really what we wanted to just show you are kind of two interesting growth dynamics in the region that our forecast sort of um, uh, ultimately uh, uh, suggest are really kind of interesting in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Uh, the orange areas are areas that really are going to go from not a whole lot of population growth or population today, population and employment, to areas that would actually be considered urban, um, would have actually sort of urban level uh, densities. Um, I will say that we're having to use census geography to do this analysis, so when you see the bigger blobs farther out, don't get too nervous about that. That doesn't mean that every square inch of that polygon is going to be urban uh, in use. It's just, you know, we're, we're sort of stuck with, with geographies there. Um, the other thing that you may be sort of straining your eyes is to understand is, is my community impacted by that? And the answer is most likely yes. Um, nearly every single jurisdiction in our region has areas that in our forecast are going to transition from non-urban to urban uses. I think it's 50 jurisdictions or more. I mean, this is a universal um, sort of situation that long term we are, the, our forecast um, is, is projecting. And again, this is very much in consultation uh, with your staffs. But in a, I think Shakti has a question, if we're good with taking questions, and I'm happy with it. I'm just curious why it goes west, uh, east but not west, the rural to urban. Because that, in some ways our urban expansion is going to be eastward and northward and southward. So, I mean, that's, there's bigger, bigger tracks, more um, availability of land um, to develop um, all those sorts of things. And more uh, higher growth aspirations in those areas at the, at the local level. Um, and so the other thing that I would just point out, and it's on the slide, is you, know, you can see, I mean, Chakti even sort of pointed out this sort of urban expansion area. All told, you take all the, and you can see there are some little orange, you know, sort of everywhere, as I mentioned, pretty much every jurisdiction gets hit by this. 127 square miles, about 23% um, of, of the region's growth. But there's another side of the growth story that's also equally interesting to us, and that are, that are these blue areas. Um, these are areas that are 
by and large, largely populated now that are actually going to see an, an, an extreme, I don't know if extreme is the right word, but certainly an, an intensification of urban development um, in those places. Um, so these are areas throughout the region that the way that we sort of modeled this or looked at the, the data was, are these areas that by the year 2040 are actually going to be more dense um, than some of our traditional um, in-town Denver neighborhoods, right, that maybe are not there now. So you can see obviously the overall footprint of that is not necessarily equal to sort of the orange here. Um, only about 14 square miles in the region sort of hit, hit that, um, uh, that measure that we put out. But that's over a third of the growth of the, of the region falling in, the, in that 14 um, square miles. So very, two very interesting and related um, sort of growth dynamics going forward. Thank you. I have a brief question. Could you repeat or say, if you didn't say, what the population density you were using for rural and for urban? So uh, uh, rather than, I'll, I'll give you, I'll tell you exact, I don't know if it's a number. I'll give you an, uh, sort of how we got there. Uh, we looked at a subdivision in Erie that did not exist a few years ago that has been built in the last couple of years that just hit what we would consider urban based on dev type, which is about a dwelling unit per acre, right? We took that subdivision and, and really all the oranges are places that fall below that today and tick above it in the future. So that's, that's the orange side. The blue was taking the Highlands neighborhood in northwest Denver and using that is, as sort of the, the bar. If you are below that today in terms of density, but above it in the year 2040, you got ticked over to blue. So again, very coarse. It was just to kind of give us an eyeball and think about the future. And we want to give you a conversation about today, and I think that's really important, but we're in many ways having a conversation about future growth, so it seemed like a reasonable thing to put in front of you. Again, I'm hoping to spark conversation. So far, we're good. So, okay. Mr. Brockett. And just for that, that blue, that Highlands neighborhood, what's a dwelling unit per acre there for that? Uh, I, I do not know. I know okay. I, I, we have a report that has it per square mile. Robin, you want to take a shot? Okay. Isn't that your district, Ms. Kinney? Yeah. It's all my district. <laughs> She's that long. So are you growing or are you ex constricting? Oh, okay. see how much that purple is my district. Shakti, please. Can we, like online, is there more close-ups? Yes, yeah, actually, and you can do a lot of exploring with, with our current forecast online, and maybe that's something that I can either, we can talk about offline or maybe just something to put out with to the entire board because it's actually something we just put up on the web that might be of interest to folks. Yep. Okay. Mr. Calvert, can you just define how far east that line is? What's the furthest piece? Uh, well, you talk like all the way here to Deer, Deer Trail or just sort of this primary, I mean. So the, the boundary itself goes as far out as Deer Trail is what you're saying. Which, the urban growth boundary or this? This particular map. Yes, there, I mean, you can see Deer Trail's got a little bit here, and I mean, it goes all the way um, to Georgetown. I mean, okay. like I said, 50-plus jurisdictions in, in this region are going to see some amount of transition from rural, air quotes, to, to urban uses. Um, the other question that, that, that you all might have is, so how much of this fits within the current urban growth boundary? Um, because of sort of the coarseness of this analysis, it's really kind of hard to give you an absolute, all of it, most of it. But in general, staff's expectation is that, by and large, this would fit not only with the, within the regional urban growth boundary, but most jurisdictions that would be impacted by this, their current allocation would be sufficient. We don't think that's probably universally true, um, but by and large, most jurisdictions that are shown as having um, orange on the map would have um, UGB currently um, in line with allocating um, this amount of growth going forward. Ms. Christman. Um. Are there overlays that you could put on this that would show us what, where, you know, the most dense office building uses, the most dense industrial, all of that, and then where that is now and what you expect it to be, so we could see how this interrelates? Sure, we could, we could probably put that together. Yep. But, but to, to Ms. Christmas' comment, isn't that really dependent upon what the municipalities and counties have submitted? Yes. So it's only as good as what the information they've been given. It's not what they're projecting. So, I mean, and, I, and I'll just, I'll say it um, in sort of my terms, and if this confuses the matter, my apologies. Um, but this was talked about at the last board meeting, our sort of overall forecasting um, process. 
in general, I would describe it as our, our primary first job is to understand long-term population and employment growth in the region in total. Like we as a region expect to grow by 1.2 million people and 600,000 jobs, right? The, what the mayor is pointing to is one of the things that is important that we do that is oftentimes and frankly largely driven by consultation with your staff and your own plans is where are the places in the region where that type of development is going to happen, right? So when we place those 1.2 million people, where are the areas in the region that, that ultimately have plans, programs, and expectations to capture um, a fair amount of that growth and where are places that maybe see themselves as not growing as much? Those are the types of conversations um, that we have at the local level to make sure we're, we're placing growth in the right spots. So that's sort of the, the, my, the key piece of my presentation. Um, I have put together some prompts to help you with the discussion. Um, again, I am largely just getting some very, very initial feedback to help us understand as we evaluate, we, and I mean staff and you, as we evaluate initiatives related to our collective effort to manage growth in this region, just to know what we're shooting for. I mean, I think that's important for us to know. So. I have a few questions here that are kind of about, again, I would call it time stamping today's growth challenges, just from your perspective, what you're observing in your own community, what you're observing throughout the region. That's kind of what we're trying to understand. We have a current initiative that is in some ways responding to a mid-90s growth pattern that's just been sort of reaffirmed over time. And if that's still an issue, you saw the map. I mean, it, we are still seeing urban expansion throughout the region, so it's not like that has changed. Um, but I'm curious if there's some nuance um, in terms of how um, uh, growth is, you observe growth happening and the challenges uh, that that growth might uh, 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 ultimately sort of, uh, that the region and your communities might be dealing with. And we'll come back to this one and then also sort of this evaluation side of things. And again, these are just prompts for discussion. Um, we can come back to this. I would also say, you know, I, I think there's a fair way to think about this that is describe to me what success looks like in your mind. What is, what is, what is success in terms of a program where we are collectively as individual communities in the region having conversations about growth? What does that look and feel like? I think that would be um, really good information for staff uh, to hear. And then I even threw in a couple of extra credit questions um, in, in the memo, just in case you get through all that and you still have lots of energy and, and just can't stop talking about that, some other ones that might be good to sort of um, hear some feedback um, from you all on. So with that, I'm ready to take notes and answer questions and all those sorts of things. Good. Comments from anyone so far? You want to think about it for a minute? <laughs> Looking at, the, at, as an example, uh, to what Doug and them alluded to with, with the growth boundary where we're projecting growth, from a lot of the stuff that we're doing in our individual communities and counties, as we're developing new projects, especially in the housing and commercial and retail areas, I think that's going to have a lot to do with the drive. We're, we're seeing a lot of movement on the basis of where is transportation headed, the inquiries coming in from uh, companies outside the metro area didn't used to talk as much about transportation as they are now because of being able to get their employees to work in a timely manner. Where can they locate where there are centers of education and opportunity for employment? So as you think about what your city or your county is doing, consider what you're doing with your own long-term development plans and looking at that as how are you going to attract residents, businesses, employers into your area if you can't get them to work? Uh, school used to be probably one of the top three things that we saw. School's down around number three now. Employment, finding qualified employees, and getting people to work, I think, have moved into the top two. Education is still in the top, but they're not finding as much of a problem finding educated staff except more in the technical areas and in the service industries and those groups are having to do a lot of traveling to get to their work places on a daily basis and getting them there whether it's through RTD or other means is still a concern that we're having that we're seeing here especially in the north end where we see a lot of growth going on. I know Mayor Williams and myself are both seeing that and we don't have a way to get people to some of the places they need even for hospital support. Uh, we have a, several hospitals have opened up along the I-25 corridor, but we don't have transit 
in the sense of getting mass transit to those locations so we can get workers there. Any comments, questions? You want to think about it and figure out we'll be back next month to go through this in detail, give you some time to think about it, Shakti? I think for me the um so the basic desire to not sprawl because of quality of life is the same as it was before. Um, and then I don't, I guess I don't know how relevant it is to this conversation, but it answers that question in that um, I know in Lakewood we have big challenges in that people don't want more growth and people want cheaper housing and cheaper transportation mm -hmm. and like they want it all they want it all right um, and so I think the the regional messaging about what is the value of growth and certain kinds of growth is helpful to us and I think one you I think you're very much on part with what we're seeing is a lot of our growth is going to be in revitalization of areas and increased density in areas not big sprawling single-family homes we're looking at consolidation and those are going to be primarily infill projects and I'll, and I'll just add one of the things that you know, the analysis that we showed earlier about sort of urban intensification and then sort of the, the growth areas is you know the UGB exists in some ways to, to, to understand the infrastructure needs of growing areas but I think the reality is those areas that are also intensifying also have infrastructure pretty significant infrastructure needs to go from maybe one type of infrastructure to another type of infrastructure that can support, you know, 150% population growth or doubling the number of uh, people or businesses in the area. So both ultimately really do need a sort of an in, a reinvigoration of infrastructure to make those places work. Okay. Ms. Sheriff Graves. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's, well, so Golden is very uh, limited boundary limited very f anyway the thing that we're hearing is businesses are concerned about moving to this area or our area because their employees don't have available housing um, so so affordable housing housing that is affordable you understand what I'm saying so that's an issue Ms. Shaw and I think that point right there is actually where we differ from the early to mid 90s. Uh, we had just gone through the savings and loan crash and housing was extremely affordable. So I do think there are some dynamics that are very different today than there, than there were. Mr. Brockett. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. The, um, I was going to say that I wonder if, if our discussions about you know urban growth boundaries and areas um, can be focused as well on transportation infrastructure, so that there's a tie in between those two. As I think previously, you know, there was we looked at it, as I understand it as just blocks that seemed like didn't necessarily matter what was within those blocks. Um, but uh, I think we have an interest in you know avoiding sprawl and in focusing our growth where there is good transportation infrastructure and transit and such mm -hmm. to um, Director Atchison's point. So I wonder if there's some way that we can combine some of those con those two <coughs> concepts uh, in what we come up with moving forward. Okay, Mr. Dyer. Um, to kind of follow along with the theme, I, and I think Dr. Cog has an integral part at helping us as individual municipalities, towns, cities, counties integrate this. I mean, to me, I think one of the challenges is the awareness of others uh, local growth plans and I mean I, I know we're doing that but um, you know to, to take that um, current information and create proactive ways to forecast needs opportunities um, such as w a, when is there an ideal time for expansion or uh, you can be more of consultative to us as a region not just uh, record keepers of of regional plans um, because for us, I mean, some of us talk, um, but uh, we may not, uh, you know, create a linkage between something that's relevant that you can sort of provide us uh, from, from the Dr. Cog aspect down to our local town. 
I, I'm curious. I, I like this. Well, I, the way that you described more consultative, less record keeper. I'm just sort of. I would love to hear the group's reaction to that. That's 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 really interesting to me as a, as a as a thread to think about how to how to bring something back to you all. So I'm just. I see a lot of head nods. So that's good. Thank you, John. Any other comments? Any follow up to what Brad's asking? Ms. Christman, go ahead. Just uh, one, and this group may have already decided this is not relevant to growth, but I think that different regions have availability, different ability to access water for future growth. Ms. Dozel. Superior is really, and it's shown here as a, an urban area because we have no place to grow. We are totally surrounded. Uh, and so we have to grow within ourselves. And um, we use the Urban Land Institute to come up with a really creative idea of how to take a central marketplace that we had and rethink it for how the streets would go through it and how we might have um, transit-oriented development uh, and urban living there along the BRT, uh, so the bus rapid transit that's right there. So it was it was it was the first time we ever thought of it as that our little suburb of Superior was actually an urban center. Uh, you know, when you talked about what are the characteristics that make up an urban center, very dense, very small area next to transportation. Uh, bus rapid transit mainly in the in the U.S. 36, but so I I like that if we saw that uh, not like but I recognize that it was right that Superior and across the road to Louisville are pretty much orange. You know we are urban now, um, and um, so I think we have to kind of rejigger how we think about some of these things. You know and and for us. We're never going to be able to put affordable housing in Superior because the market doesn't allow it. You know, people, builders can come in and build six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollar, very small, very narrow, very tall brownstones in Superior in our town center, and or one story residential living, a, a single story, single level story living for again six hundred fifty to eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. But, you know, it's outrageous. You can't even talk about affordable housing. But yet, the people that live in Superior will drive or transit a long way to get to a job. They'll go to Boulder, or most all of them go into Denver. I used to live in Boulder and actually worked in the Denver Tech Center years ago when I was young and foolish. And uh, But I wouldn't do it now. But so transportation is a big issue, and very small towns that live along the front range are all going to be urban because they're going to be places that people want to live and then they're going to want to get out of there to go work. When I see 65,000 cars go every day into Boulder past my house on 36, it's just frightening. It's frightening and then to see the purple there. So, you know, it's it's how do you get how do you get the movement of the people out of these urban centers is really the key that wasn't there before. Because there weren't just the, the magnitude of the numbers of people moving every day, transiting along the corridor are just staggering, staggering. Ms. Williams? The only other thing I wanted to bring up is that our, our jobs have changed since the 1990s. And so we need to kind of look at, you know, we're not looking at just, you know, manufacturing jobs. We have all kinds of really diverse job market or workforce. and. You know, I guess I would also just piggyback on as somebody else said it that you know workforce housing needs to be located close to those to those job centers. And so, how do we first of all, how do we get workforce housing because that's the question of the hour right now. But then once we do, making sure they're located closer to the urban centers or to the to the jobs. Okay, Ms. Kanich. Thanks. Um, this has been really helpful in spurring thinking. And as I was listening to Rita and uh, uh, to Aaron talk. I was thinking about, can you go back to the map, just mm -hmm. with the purple? So I think that there's really different transportation constraints and costs when you're talking about the orange areas compared to the purple. And I think one of the challenges as we go through our transportation planning is having conversations where you're trying to score 
or have those different things compete. And here's, here's my example. When you are, I call it retrofitting an existing urban area. So Quebec Avenue, if you've ever been in Quebec, is a great example of where you know, we added all the density at Lowry and at Stapleton, but you have an existing right of way which is pretty constrained and we're going to you know, kill ourselves to add some actual right of way, but that's a one-time deal. After that, you just, without taking enormous tracts of homes or apartment buildings or businesses, you can't add right of way in most of these purple areas, which means that it is probably, and you, uh, Steve Cook can probably confirm this, but I'm guessing it's, it's much more expensive per mile to do because it is, you know, the, 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 so, so to, to add capacity in orange area, you know, might be X dollars per mile, but to add, you know, bike infrastructure, protected lanes, pedestrian infrastructure, and all the multimodal, like whether it's a, a fast lane for a bus, I just, I have to assume there's some, some additional cost. And so I just think that as we think about what to do with, with this stuff as we go into the transportation planning, I just think that's really relevant about, so, so you want to say to the purple areas, you know, like Superior, like if you're, it's, it, it's good. You're helping, the purple areas are helping to prevent the sprawl, but there's a certain kind of transportation investment or um, infrastructure that's going to be unique to support that. And, and I think that it's just, you know, it's really different than, because I know it's a different constraint to add new transportation infrastructure where there isn't any. But um, anyway. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, Rob and Rita both hit on, as you start to think about redevelopment think about what's in the ground you've got utility systems electrical power system telecommunications have been in the ground for years when you start to intensify that density that doesn't mean that those utility systems that are there today can meet your demand so then you're starting to think about I got to go rip up miles of infrastructure that's put in and replace that if I can even supply it I have parts of my city that are undeveloped they were set up and they were planned out with certain land use I'm being requested to change that land use to four and five times its density of what it was originally planned for and I can't meet it without millions and millions of dollars of investment for one project is it really worth it will the developer pick up that cost probably not because then it takes like what Rita was talking about Workforce housing goes out the door of any opportunity when that happens because they've got to stay at market rate or higher in order to recover their cost. Doug, go ahead. Thanks, sir, very much. Um, yeah, I find this map fascinating. I, you know, I, I know, you know, the urban plus plus, the purple. I mean, we were not having that discussion in the mid '90s, right? And to to the point that you know, Director Knees and Dozel both mentioned, it's it it's fascinating to me the different discussion that we have to have because really the orange that you see is the traditional UGBA discussion we've had about growth management but you know the purple now adds that additional variable that we need to have a discussion about is like how do you address that growth that we know is going to occur how do you produce that infrastructure in order to support it but you know it's, it's just a it's a conscious conversation we need to have and one FYI um, the case study that Director Dozel mentioned with regards to what, what ULI had done we're hoping to present that to the full board April. in April. So just FYI. Okay. Ms. Christman. Another one of the considerations is the loss of affordable housing that used to be in uh, floodplains. That was a lot of affordable housing uh, in trailers, et cetera, located in floodplains. I think most jurisdictions, you know, I can't address Cherry Hills, but most jurisdictions have changed that. Uh, those 100-year floodplains uh, seem to flood every 20 years or so now. And um, I've, I've noticed that those are, are um, getting closed down. So that is existing that you may want to replace that people are going to have to look at. And generally, um, I don't think there's any growth, realistic growth in floodplains now. Okay. Other comments, questions? Mr. Teeter? In Commerce City, 
uh, things have really changed over the last few years. Um, our population went from in the, the 20s to over 53,000 now. We are building homes as fast as we can build them. And um, we've got a lot of industry that's coming in right now. And we were actually forced to um, bite the bullet ourselves and start expanding Tower Road to a four-lane highway from a two-lane highway. And we took um, Highway 2 back from the state. And we are now maintaining Highway 2. And we are also turning that into a four-lane highway. Because coming through Carmen City during rush hour is getting to the point now where it's a steady line of cars for two, three hours. And, and we had to bite the bullet and, and get those roads turned into four lanes. And it's changing up there, changing quick. Okay, any other questions or comments from anyone? Can I, can I just, one of the extra credit questions in the memo, I would love just to get maybe a few minutes on the very last question in the memo, ask, are there tangible next steps or products that come to mind that would be helpful in this conversation? This map seemed to spark a little bit of conversation, so I, I'm just, I, I would love to hear from you. We're obviously going to come back and talk about sort of the current state of affairs, but if there's anything that comes to mind for you about, okay, I would like to know more about X, Y, Z, you know, I, that would be helpful so that we obviously are putting stuff in front of you that continues to advance um, this sort of a design um, of this initiative that really obviously is pretty central to what we do at Dr. Cog. Ms. Kanich. I heard almost every speaker tonight mention workforce housing, and I don't know if that's in your model. Um, but to the extent that we have previously mapped some of the, um, you know, deed restricted housing is one thing. I thought you guys might have, uh, I thought as part of our study back a lifetime ago when the grant was going on, we might have gotten a map of market affordability. It'd be interesting to overlay how much of that market affordability is in these orange areas, for example, because those are probably pretty at risk. Uh, so, so I think the overlay of this map with the market affordability map is it would be just an interesting thing in terms of prompting, um, you know, or even um, I, almost a reverse engineering. I don't. You, you've done this going forward, yes. Yes. I'm just curious if there's a way to go backwards at all to see whether or not we've had, I mean, I think we intuitively assume there's been a loss of units in areas that, you know, maybe densified. We don't know that. So I, I anyway, it just seems to me to be a common interest, and we already have some data sets. So when, whether we can make those data sets talk would be of interest. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, one of the things that comes to, to a plan or comes to mind is something that, that the mayor said really from the very beginning is, you know, you see this idea of urban expansion, and it, and, it, and it gives you potentially the hope that you can build more affordable housing in these places because the cost of land is less. But then you have businesses that simply wonder, can my workforce actually live there and get to the, to the job that I need them to fill? So there is that tension between <coughs> affordability and the cost of land, raw land to build housing and how far someone can be to actually access the jobs that are in our region. So, I mean, there's, there's clearly some tension there. Ms. Williams? So um, I had a meeting with my staff yesterday. Since I'm new to Dr. Cog, I said, what's the point of this UGB slash A? And they said, that's a great question. <laughs> we don't know for sure if it's really being used. And so I think that our question would be, is this really the model we want to go forward with, or is there a better tool that we can use uh, in the future? And so that was kind of just comments from the staff. And this is the exercise. That's the perfect distillation of what I'm hopeful this group is doing. I want. I want you to sort of fact check and reality check the way that we ought to be, um, what, how this conversation might be most productive at the regional level and then obviously for you locally. That, that's what we're hoping to unearth here so that we can design an initiative that works um, as best as possible. So. Okay. Mr. Dye. Uh, I guess two comments now. Um, UGB, UGA, um, I kind of view it as more of a, a, a brand name for a program or a, a framework that, that we use to communicate what our future plans are to, to Dr. Cog. And, um, you know, I don't want it to be punitive. I want it to be efficient. And um, I don't want to tell anybody else how to, how to build their municipality. So that's the UBG, UBA. Um, in terms of products, uh, the only thing I have during, uh, in my notes here, maybe a higher level heat map of future growth. Um, 
broadening out Director Kanish's, you know, residential, commercial, re uh, uh, where are those, um, where are those things happening? And maybe we can drill down into residential if it's single family, multifamily, and then we can kind of drill down into those attributes. Um, you know, to me, um, you know, my interest, you know, RTD, um, where are the bus lines, what kind of capacities do they have, um, you know, frequency of, of, of bus lines and also capacity of, of, of major roadways and, and how, you know, how efficiently are they used? Um, are they getting to a potential where we need to consider as a region? to focus efforts to maybe find some alternative accesses, you know, such as, you know, emphasizing, um, you know, mass transit or bike pedestrian lanes, something like that. Okay. Mr. Brockett. Yeah, the Director Dyke, this, this is a great idea. I was thinking along similar lines in that kind of heat map I, idea and Director Kniech's concept of getting in, you know, uh, data on uh, market housing. Although I think the important thing there would be to combine it with the housing plus transportation costs. But I, because I wonder if you could create something that, um, that overlaid different data sets about, um, you know, potential affordability of housing in certain areas, the level of uh, transportation infrastructure in certain areas like I was talking about before, and other different kinds of variables that might produce an analysis of land that might be better suited towards development that meets the goals of our region and land that might be less well suited. And I realize we're, we're not going to be telling anyone exactly what to do with their municipality, but we might be able as a regional planning organization to offer guidance about um, the kinds and areas uh, of uh, the kinds of areas that would produce development that works better for the whole region. Okay. Shakti. So I like the idea of having some system that um, shows a real commitment to not having sprawl, which I think um, the system we have now, at least in some of its iterations, has been. Um, so uh, that's part of my value. And, and I think part of it is that um, all the different jurisdictions are feeling the pain just in different ways. So um, like I said, um, in Lakewood, we don't have a lot of room to grow past where we're supposed to because we're urban, but we are having significant tension around um, the amount of density and growth that's happening. And so, and, and my argument to my constituents is um, we're doing this because it helps with the cost of transportation, because it reduces the amount of sprawl, because, and, I think in order for that to be true, there needs to be coordination between the different jurisdictions. Um, and then uh, in, and on a sort of more specific note, I think it might help to see this map to, to have another color that's the urban, just the regular urban. Other comments or questions? Mr. Calvert, anything else? Thank you. Hang in there. I think this is going to be a really, I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, hopefully that excitement spreads and everybody can really want to think about um, some really interesting questions that obviously our region is wrestling with and I think that map is a, is a reasonable portrayal of that, much less sort of the more closer to the ground stories we've heard today. And our hope is we can um, obviously create um, a dialogue at the regional level that, that, that helps with um, localized conversations as well and we understand your own um, growth aspirations that's important for the region to know for any number of reasons so hopefully uh, and I fully expect us uh, to get there over the next few months okay ladies and gentlemen that was the last item on the agenda hope everyone has input uh, to their satisfaction I hate to tell you but we're now adjourned yes and for those of you that are yeah. part of the P&E, there's hot dogs and beanie weenies. <laughs> I know, I was like, I might have to go home now. Never be true. That will never Darn. be true. Never be true, never yeah. True. And sign that P.O. I'm not submitting I know you wouldn't. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> So you said you Yes. Yeah, even up there.
I can come to your computer. Whether I'm explaining it, I, I can't give it to Hey, I just wanted to tell you, I've had a couple times that he went for Because I, everyone has that.